pray. Amen. So we are, uh, we are finishing up a sermon series that we've been in for a few weeks called Pivotal Moments, where we are looking at places where Jesus steps into a situation and changes the direction. A uh, pivotal moment are those times in life when, when something happens and, our, and our, the, the direction changes. It's, it's a drastic shift. Sometimes those are good things and sometimes those are, are challenging things. But they all make us aware that, that we're going a new way. And so we're looking at scripture and looking at different stories or different events, different passages where Jesus steps into a situation. And he uses an event or uses something to, to kind of be the, the rallying point or the motive to change the, the tide, to change the direction. So we've looked at how Jesus used a basin of water. He took a basin of water and took it to the feet of the disciples and began to wash the disciples' feet. And all of a sudden, the disciples begin to understand who Jesus is. And that act itself was so countercultural, but it changed the direction. How Jesus healed the blind man with some mud. He comes to a man born blind and he puts mud on his eyes, and all of a sudden the man is able to see. But that wasn't the pivotal moment. The pivotal moment was later in the chapter when the man comes back to Jesus and his heart is changed. His whole life goes a whole new direction. Pastor Rob shared about the coins and the weight of those coins on Judas's conscience. Last week we had All Church Sunday. We had awesome service. Uh, All Church Sunday, and we had heard the testimony of Tia, who shared how she went from brokenness and addiction to a life of healing and freedom because Jesus stepped in. Because Jesus stepped into her life, and she gave her life to Christ, and things changed a whole new direction. So this morning, we're looking at another event where Jesus steps in, and he changes the direction. It's a pivotal moment. It's a major pivotal moment for all of us, and it comes through the manger. It comes through the manger and the birth of Jesus. A lot of times when we get to Advent or we get to the Christmas season, we hear sermons that we've heard over and over and over again. I mean, we hear scriptures that we've referenced and we, we probably even share in our own homes. And, and sometimes the Christmas story becomes very numb to us. And so I want to challenge us this morning, I want to challenge us for this morning's service, but also for this Advent season, this Christmas season, that the Christmas story does not become numb. But all of a sudden, it comes alive. That you listen differently, that you look at it differently, that you apply it differently, and you allow the truth of Jesus to penetrate into who you are and to change you. So this morning, we're going to look at a specific part of that story of how Jesus steps into uh, the situation, how Jesus arrives, and how the manger uh, changes the direction of life. So we're going to look at Luke's account, Luke chapter 2. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn there. If you're using the Bible that's provided, it's on page 832. Uh, and if you don't have a Bible, you claim that Bible is yours. You write your name in there, you take that Bible home with you, and uh, you claim that is yours. So Luke chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Cornelius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. 
And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloth and and laying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about, about this child. And all that heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So when we read about the birth of Jesus, when we read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when we read about the birth of Jesus, Luke is the only one that references the manger. And and three different times he references the manger. In verse 7, she gave birth to her firstborn a son. She wraps him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Verse 12, this will be a sign to you, you will find a baby wrapped in, in cloths and, pl- and lying in a manger. And then verse 16, so they, talking about the shepherds, hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Now, we're going to look at the manger, but I want us to understand what is taking place here. In verse 11, the greatest news ever declared the greatest news ever proclaimed, the greatest news that we could ever hear was shared. In verse 11, the angels show up and the angels declare that today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. I want that to sink into you. I want want you to, to think about that for a moment. Today, the Savior has been born. The Messiah has arrived the Lord is here. Imagine the, the awe and wonder that the shepherds had to hear when they heard those words. Today the Savior has been born. Today the Messiah has arrived. Today your Lord is here. But also imagine how unprepared they probably felt, right? Today, your Lord is here. And not just that announcement, and that announcement in itself was, was the greatest news ever received, the greatest proclamation ever made. But it's being made to the shepherds. And we'll get into that in a moment. And that Savior, the Messiah, the Lord, is in Bethlehem. If you understand the culture of that day, Bethlehem was a forgotten, overlooked city. Bethlehem was insignificant. Bethlehem was was that that, uh, city that you just, you know, you fly over. (laughs) You walk through. You bypass. You, You don't even stop in Bethlehem. And the angels declare that today the Savior has been born in Bethlehem. What news? The angels go on in verse 12, and they tell the shepherds that there will be a sign. There will be a sign for them, and you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. There will be a sign. The the word that the angels actually use is is a, a word that refers to a supernatural sign. It would be the same kind of thing as as parting of the Red Sea or walking on water or raising somebody from the dead. Like supernatural. Amazing. You could not miss it. 
there will be a sign that, you, that the baby has been born. There will be a sign. You won't miss this sign. So reading this, I mean, the shepherds, when they heard this and hear that word and understand the, the depth and the power of that word, they'd be thinking like, okay, the moon's going to change colors or the, the stars are going to align and they're going to spell out Jesus' name and point an arrow to where he is. Like, that's how amazing this word is. There will be a sign to you. So the shepherds, they hear this, this declaration that there will be a sign. And the sign is this. You will find a baby. What? You're going to find a baby. These must not be the angels from heaven. Like, what are you talking about? A baby. You see, the Jews were waiting for a warrior to come and save them. The Roman Empire, they were looking, they were keeping watch for somebody that was an influencer, that was going to turn the tide of the people. Like, they, they knew the prophecy of the Old Testament. They knew that, that there was going to be a Savior, a Redeemer. There was going to be a Messiah that was going to come. But, but they're looking for somebody that has a little more strength. That's somebody that has a little more power, has a little more influence. We have to find a baby? Or there's a baby? That's our Lord? That's our Savior? That's our Messiah? Is a baby? He's going to be the one that changes our world? I'm sure the shepherds were a little confused. I mean, we read the story, and we know how it ends, and we know all the pieces, and we're like, ah. The shepherds are like, this doesn't make sense. This isn't what we've been expecting. This isn't what we've been talking about. And the shepherds had to also be thinking, why are the angels talking to us? Bethlehem is that overlooked, insignificant city. Well, shepherds, we're not people of influence. Shepherds were often overlooked. Shepherds were often avoided because they were dirty and, and they smelled funny. Shepherds were, the, were a lower class. Why are the angels telling us? And those two facts alone that Jesus came to Bethlehem and Jesus came to the shepherds says a lot about who Jesus is. It says a lot about our God. So there's going to be a baby. Man, if, if they weren't paying attention, they'd miss it. It's kind of like what happens in our world. A lot of people still miss the meaning of Christmas because they're not looking for the baby. But there will be a sign to you, and, and you'll be looking for a baby that's wrapped in clothes or cloths. A baby wrapped in cloths. And, and that day, that, that wasn't abnormal. That wasn't unique for Jesus. When a baby was born, the mother would take uh, pieces of clothing and, and wrap it around the baby's arms and legs and then around his torso. And so you have this, like, little mummy baby. But it was for protection. It was for comfort. And that was, that was, un that was how every baby was treated. And so for, for the shepherds they're told there's a there's a sign you're going to find a baby that's wrapped in cloth well all the babies are wrapped in cloth how are we going to know which one Where, that's not unique that's not special but the declaration that proclamation the sign goes on not only will you find a baby who's wrapped in cloth but lying in a manger one that's lying in a manger. Now, you know, we know the Christmas stories and we know the Hallmark movies and, and we've seen the, the Christmas cards. And, and so we understand the, the manger. 
We understand that there might be some wood contraption that kind of looks like that or a trough of some kind. But you have to understand, when, when the angels declare that there is a baby that's going to be wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger, how ca- countercultural that is. <laughs> because a manger, what the, the angels are saying, the, the Latin word means to chew or to eat. All right? And so it's a feeding trough. It could have been maybe a wooden structure, but more than likely, it was a pile of rocks in the circle on the ground where the grain was poured, or it was a place in the cave or in the side of a hill where the rock was kind of grooved out. It was a place where the animals ate their food, where the straw the, or the, the hay and the grass or the grain was placed. I'm sure when Mary and Joseph came and they found that this is our only option, I'm sure they probably got the Clorox wipes out and tried to clean it up the best they could. We're going to have a baby, and we're going to place a baby in a manger. That's not what you do. That's not normal. But that's what the angel said the sign was. That's how you'll find the right baby. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. One pastor said, no other king anywhere in the world was lying in a feeding trough. Find him and you find the king of kings. I love the response. or I love the next step here. As soon as the angels declare about the, the baby and, and his location, Verse 13 and 14, suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. On earth, peace to those who, on whom his favor rests. Glory to God, our Savior is here and he's in a manger. Glory to God, our Messiah is here and he is in a manger. Glory to God, our Lord is here and he is in a manger. You know what that manger did? That that manger allowed Jesus to be real and acceptable to everyone. Jesus could have been born in a palace. Jesus could have been born with pop and circumstance. Jesus could have been born in, in, in some special, unique, creative way where all of the elite of the elite would have seen him and been there. But then only the elite of the elite would have been able to go to him. When Jesus is born in Bethlehem, an insignificant town, when Jesus is born and and the message is given to the shepherds, the insignificant people, and Jesus is born in a location, in a manger that is very insignificant, Jesus becomes acceptable to all of us. Jesus... There's no guard standing there saying you're not allowed. Jesus says, come. Verses 15 through 18, as soon as the angels left the shepherds, the shepherds decided, let's go. Let's go and see. Let's go and find the Jesus. Let's go and find our Messiah, our Savior. Let's go find our Lord. We're looking for a baby that's wrapped in cloth, but one that's lying in a manger. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, a little picture of who Jesus is, who being the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to, that he used to his own advantage, rather He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. We see Jesus stepping into a situation and changing the direction. We see Jesus stepping into our world, stepping into our lives, and and shows himself as Lord, Messiah, Savior. And it changes the direction of life. 
the pivotal moment was not the manger. We've been talking about the manger. We've been talking about uh, how unique it is. But the pivotal moment was not the manger. The pivotal moment was who was in the manger. Our Savior. Our Messiah. Our Lord was in the manger. And because of that, our lives change. Because of that, our lives, the direction of our life can change. Advent is a, is a time when we prepare. Advent means waiting and preparing and anticipating. And that's what Advent is. It's a period of time, weeks leading up to Christmas, where we are supposed to, to reflect and remember and, and anticipate with awe and wonder This Christmas season, let us not go numb to the Christmas story. Let us not hear those words of, of Luke 2 or others when, and just go numb to it. I've heard that hundreds of times before. I, I know how it goes. I could quote it for you. But this Christmas season, let us be like the shepherds. Let us be in awe and wonder. And let us go and find Jesus. And when we find Jesus, let us return glorifying God and telling everybody else about who was in the manger. Let that come alive this Advent season. Let us dedicate ourselves to be just like the shepherds. We're not worthy. We're not worthy to hear the truth of Jesus. But it comes to us. It's available to us. Jesus is there for us. So let us go and find him. Let us go and look for him. And then let us tell others about who Jesus is. Would you stand with me this morning as we close our service? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will send us out from this place with hearts that are filled, with minds that are challenged, with a soul that is hungry, of knowing you, of being awe, of, of having wonder and awe of who you are. Let us continue to, to search. Let us continue to learn. Let us continue to grow in who you want us to be. And Lord, let us be like the shepherds. As we find you, as we know you, let us tell others about who you are. In your name we pray.